dear friends so we reached the finale of this too long rather uh, intimidating discussions on the intellectual traditions in india and this final session we have this very even more daunting a topic at least for me uh, numbers in india from shunya to sarva and everything in between uh, a paper that's going to be presented by professor p p divagaran and it's my honor and privilege uh, to have been chosen by sundreshan sir to chair this session because i came to uh, get to know professor p p divagaran through a person whom he mentioned yesterday that is dr saraswati amma so uh, in her absence i thank her also sir for enabling me to get to know you though your field is rather out of bounds for me bharatiya sankhya sankalpam shunyam mudal sarvam vare enna vishayathilana pp divagaran sir nammalode samsarikkan povunnathu koodal aine petti onnum ariyathathu konde adhigam samayam vaigikkade nan sir ne sabineyam kshanikkunu once again i say thanks to everybody here especially the people who uh, caused this wonderful gathering of people to come together i mean always uh, i have i've been very impressed by i've been i've enjoyed myself thoroughly in the last one and a half days and uh, for me the most interesting part of the seminar is how so many different things so many different aspects of our early intellectual traditions which people have talked about connect to the very very narrow field in which i am personally interested uh, much of what people talked about are far above my head but here and there i catch a phrase or i catch an idea then i said ah but this is exactly what nilakantha said or this is exactly what bhaskaracharya said so uh, it's very pleasing for me and uh, so and i take away from this uh, little little gathering little meeting uh, certain certain uh, what shall i say certain perceptions of what uh, delving into our traditions means to the participants in this conference and certain common themes uh, emerged and i shall mention them at the end of my talk uh, for the time being i'll carry on so this is the title there is another part of the title which i have not typed which says uh, and everything in between so most of the talk will be about the things in between uh, shunya and sarva will arise in a natural way while i describe uh, in a uh, while i describe the uh, number systems or the understanding of numbers in india uh, numbers you know you would say what is there to talk about numbers it's very it's part of our common life everybody is most people are numerate it's as much a part of our everyday life as literacy is most people can manage numbers very well from the uh, the fish seller in the market up to uh, except the planning commission members in delhi they can't handle numbers they have a problem but everybody else understands them very well oh, and the rbi governor he can't handle the big numbers so given this situation there is no need to for me to uh, say why it's an interesting thing to look at and i hope that it will come through while i speak when we say numbers we mean very specifically numbers in the indian way of counting which has now become the universal way of counting which is the decimal number system dashamana uh, it literally means measuring numbers by 10 that's what it means measurement by 10 and uh, that is the only number system we all know in the sense that that's the universal system that's what everybody uses that's we don't have to say you know uh, this is what i really mean but i'll give you the number in binary nobody say it nobody does that that's finished uh, only the computer scientists worry about uh, binaries the uh, rest of us don't so uh, given this situation i don't have to explain why it's uh, why it's an interesting thing to look at except to say there are certain fundamental principles underlying the the very possibility of being able to express numbers in this way by using 10 as a unit of measurement the other thing is even though it is now universal uh, historically it was far from universal many ancient civilizations many primitive societies today cannot count beyond small numbers because they have no 
they, they haven't got the, uh, the theoretical foundation, the tattwa for dealing with, uh, to use your term, to deal with uh, this somewhat subtle subject. Now everybody knows there are many primitive societies. Even among the so-called advanced societies, it is a very, very late acquisition. Uh, the ability to count in a quantitatively precise way. It is not a universal, it's not a historical fact that people always knew how to count. The Greeks didn't know how to count, literally. They'll come to a certain number, they'll call it myriad. Then they'll say, what do you do after that? Oh, myriad of myriad we can handle, we know what it means. Take a pile of myriad objects and take myriad piles of myriad objects and then put them together. But how do you count them? They had no idea. Uh, Archimedes, for example, a very great scientist, he really had no idea. Euclid's, Euclid's geometry, the, you know, the model for the deductive system of reasoning which has taken over the, the, the uh, modern world of knowledge and science. Euclid has no numbers in the geometry part of it. There is only one. I went through the first four books. The fifth and sixth books are about very qualitative things. There won't be numbers in them. Later, the other books are probably not written by Euclid, but written by people later. In the first four books, there is exactly one number. That number is the biggest number you can have, the smallest number you can have, which is not one, two. And the uh, result is, it is actually not two as a number. It says, the area of a parallelogram is twice the area of a triangle with the same base and the same altitude. Okay. Simply says, you know, take it twice, you get the total area. That's what it says. Uh, this being the case, uh, it should not be surprising to us. You know, because the history of how the decimal numbers traveled first to Persia, then to, um, then to <coughs> the Abbasid kingdom of uh, Baghdad, and then from there to Italy, to Venice, and then from there to all of Europe is well known. 17th century, which is, you know, as uh, historical time goes, which is the day before yesterday, uh, 17th century, this is what the great scientist Isaac Newton said in one of his unpublished uh, works. I mean, there are these papers, mathematical papers are collected together, edited by a very, very great man called uh, White, what's his name, Whitehouse, Derek Whitehouse. Uh, this is what he says, I'm amazed that it has occurred to no one to fit the doctrine recently established for decimal numbers. For him, it was brand new that you can use 10 as the base to count numbers with, to measure numbers with. So, uh, so it's a very, very recent acquisition. Uh, I will not say anything about the Chinese understanding of numbers and how to measure them uh, because uh, Chinese primary sources are absent. Chinese is a culture which is very rich in secondary sources but not very rich in... If you look at a text from the 5th or 6th century, they will say 1,000 years ago, the great master so-and-so said this. There is no way of authenticating this kind of information. The Chinese still do it. They'll say, 2,000 years ago, Chinese were grazing the cattle on the plateau of Tibet. There's no way of verifying. There's no way of checking these things. So uh, I, as uh, you probably know from my lecture yesterday, uh, I would like to have documented support for what I say. And when I don't have it, I'll say I'm making guesses. 19th century England, you won't believe this, very famous mathematicians, a man called uh, Peacock, for example, well-known mathematician, whose books are still available. Uh, he founded a movement to dispute the fact or to dispute the idea that negative numbers are numbers. He said they're not numbers. So, uh, so it's not completely... Uh, now, I have said I'm going to use talk about decimal numbers, but that is, of course, not the only by... This is called a base. The, the unit with which you measure numbers is called a base and plays a big role in the mathematics of numbers. Now, there are ways, you, the base is not fixed, um, not fixed by uh, logical or other such, uh, you know, epistemic considerations. It is determined primarily by, psych by our ability to memorize, our ability to communicate things without having a constant reference back to uh, records. Uh, 10 is a good choice. I'll, if I have time, I'll, I'll say why later. Uh, but other bases have been used. You cannot use too small a base. 2 is not going to help you very much because uh, no, small numbers will go from here to here and it's very difficult to keep track of the 
series of zeros and ones and so on and so forth. Very large bases are also not a very good idea because uh, the fundamental thing about numbers, that we have all learnt our multiplication tables. Okay? And uh, I learned them up to 16 times 16. Uh, of course, you don't need to learn it up to 16 times 16. It's enough to learn up to 10 times 10 because, or 9 times 9. Because after that, we have rules. The rules are called rules of long multiplication. If you know the rules, and the rules are very simple to remember. If you know the rules, you don't have to memorize any more multiplication. Same with addition, you know, you'll be surprised. Uh, if you say, what is 5 and 4? Everybody will say 9. How do you know? How do you know? All you have to do, what you have to do is to take 5 objects, then you take 4 objects, put them together and count. So, uh, the, the, there is a very big difference between numbers below the base and the numbers above them, the compound numbers. Because for the manipulating those numbers, we have rules. And it's enough to learn those rules. In the third standard, we begin to learn long multiplication and long addition. Not only multiplication, but also addition. Other, everything else comes later. But up to 9 times 9, there is no way in which you know it except by doing an experiment and memorizing the results. So the low, the s small numbers, the numbers which uh, Bhartruhari, uh, who talked about Bhartruhari yesterday, uh, there is numbers up to nine. Bhartruhari calls them Adya Sankhya. And for the Adya Sankhya, there is, there is no, there is no logical way of remembering how to manipulate them. Memory is the only source. And consensus, we must agree, all of us must agree, that the name of nine conveys an idea of nineness, which is the same for me and for Professor Sundareshwaran. Must be the same, otherwise it's useless. You can also talk of numbers, uh, another, yeah, so i so how do we actually count? Given large numbers of objects, what do we do? This is what we do. I give, uh, I take the number 1525 as an example. It's a favorite number of mine because I think this is the year in which Yuktivasha was written by Jayashadeva. Okay, 1,525, we take away 10, we, this is our, it's our meter stick, 10 is our meter stick. You measure by 10, take away as many 10s as you can, you take away 152 10s and you're left with 5. It's always less than 10, okay. Then you repeat the process, 152, you measure by 10 again, that is 15 times 10 plus 2. Then you carry on and many many things you can say when you end up with what you end up with is this 1525 is 1525 is what we do is we write it as 1 times 1000 5 times 100 2 times 5 and 5 all added together first you multiply the powers of 10 by the adya sankhya then you add them together and in the process of multiplication especially in the process of adding you have to supply what are called carryover rules. That is to say, if I have five and, let's say five and three added together, I get 15. But my numbers, the, the things I want are always Adya Sankhya, the atomic numbers. Therefore, I'll take, promote one, two to the place of tens. So 15 will become one times 10 plus five. Now put them in the correct order number of hundreds to be added, number of tens to be added, number of etc, etc, etc. Now, uh, I have given an abstract form for the same thing. That is to say, given any number, this is what you do. You divide the number by 10, you get a dividend, a result of the a quotient, a result of the division, plus a remainder. Then that remainder is called n naught. In the, that is, uh, the one in the place of uh, zero powers of ten. That's what it means, the power in the place of ones. Then you do it again, repeat it again, repeat it again. And finally, what you get is a sequence of coefficients, nk. nk is one in my problem here. Then uh, nk minus one is the number of hundreds. nk minus two is the number of tens, and etc., etc. n naught. So, uh, this is the identification of a number. There is no other identification at all. It's very simple. Um, so, when you have it, what we do is, 
uh, instead of writing it in this complicated way, so many powers of 10 add together and so on and so forth. We say, all right, we give, we indicate the power by the place it occupies and just write the numbers N0, N1 in a sequence. This is 1525, is 1525 because of this rule, okay? So this is the abstract way of, I mean, this representation of a number, powers of 10, I will call it the polynomial representation. I call it the polynomial representation because the general form in which it is written is nowadays called a polynomial. Okay. So this is the true identity of the number. Now you can express more abstractly. Uh, you can think of numbers without a base at all. You think of them, you know, uh, that's a very, in, the, in Europe, it's a very, very late uh, phase of the thing, end of the 19th century. There is an absolutely brilliant passage in Yukti Bhasha uh, in which he tells you what the identity of a number is without having a base in a base independent way and uh, these are uh, about a half dozen uh, indicators of an absolutely modernist approach uh, that the Nara school brought about in mathematics in India. Now why am I here? The, there is a prehistory to what I'm going to say and there is also an archaeology to what I'm going to say. This part, am I hiding anything? No, you can see. Yeah. This, this part, the archaeology part in our country begins in, not uh, in the Vedic times. I have a lot to say about the Vedic times. Uh, but in pre-Vedic times, in the Indus Valley civilization. And I showed this slide because it is extremely beautiful as, a, as an object, a craft object. You know, you don't have to think of them. These are weights. Now, the Indus Valley people, uh, my conviction is that they use the base 8 and other people say the same thing. And there is a reason for it because when you think of the Indus Valley civilization, you think of Mohenjo-daro, what do you have in your mind? Millions of baked bricks, the bricks everywhere. And these bricks are standard, the, most of them, most of them are standard. They're standard, their uh, thickness to width to length is in the proportion 1 to 2 to 4. So they were a very binary society. They, and you see this all the time. The weights also increase multiples of 2. At a higher level, you also have multiples of 10. So 16, 160, 1600 and so on and so forth. But the basic progression is binary. Okay. This is a series of binarily progressing weights. And they're made of very beautiful stone, polished with extreme carefulness and precision. And the weights are, differ by a factor of two, by less than 4%. This is, uh, this is quite recent work, by the last 10 years, it's mostly the Americans who have done this. Kenoya, uh, Mark Kenoya. And uh, this work is, uh, is, is a very good starting point for this. Now, the reason why the weights are interesting is, uh, as a footnote, is that uh, to make a volume which is twice the volume of what you had before in the form of a cube, you have to make a cube whose side is the cube root of 2 times the previous one. Because you multiplied 3 times, it's cube root of 2 multiplied 3 times is 2. So if you want to double the weight, you have to increase the height by a ratio of cube root of 2. Now, cube root of 2, how did they know the cube root of 2? So, well, Aryabhata has a cube root of 2 algorithm. That's the first we know in India. Okay. And it's fairly complicated. So, how did they do it? They could not have done it by experimentation because, you know, uh, every time you have these beautiful stones and you cut them and you make a mistake, you throw it away. That's what you have to do. There's nothing else you can do. More interestingly, to double the weight, there is another simpler way. You don't make them cubes. You take a brick and increase any dimension by a factor of two. That's enough. That multiplies the volume by two, therefore the weight by two. They didn't do that. They chose the hard way. Okay. I think they were showing off, if you ask me. <laughs> yeah, we know them. they are very, very advanced. You know, This is a very new subject, the, uh, the archaeology of Indus Valley mathematics. It's a, it's a fascinating subject. There are lots of things one can say. Many things, geometric, they, they made great, great, great uh, geometric discoveries. Uh, but this is, that's not 
it's not the time for that. So, now the, that is the archaeology. This is the prehistory. Before you, uh, when you measure something, uh, what do you do? You first compare two things. You know, if I want to measure the distance from here to there, and I have a meter stick, I compare it, I measure it as many times as I can. Simpler, if I have two piles of objects, if I want to see which is bigger, what do I do? I pair them, I take one from one pile and one from the other. When I run out of one pile or the other, then I know that what remains had more objects than the one before. This is very, just very plain common sense. Uh, there is little doubt that that is how counting began, the Shamana began in India. I have little doubt about that. And Taitiriya Samhita, which is the, uh, which is the, uh, the southern recension of the Yajur Veda, is full, full, you know, unbelievably large number of... You know, by the way, I have to say that the, the Vedic, uh, the Samhita uh, texts, Rigveda has about 3,000 numbers in it, which I asked many people at that time. And I first, you know, it's, if you don't mind, mind a personal anecdote, I was actually reading uh, Wendy Doniger's uh, Rigveda selection of poems. Where is it? Pokata. No, I use my hands, you know, <laughs> so it's very difficult. I'm like the, I'm like the Italian, the Italian policeman, he could not put the handcuffs on his criminal because his hands were otherwise occupied. So, <laughs> so <laughs> it's very many numbers and those numbers are absolute gold mine of information on the development of number names. And then I'm, go then I'm going to talk about in a while. But for the present, what I want to say is, now, of course, you know, all you Vedic specialists, uh, according to everybody's general, I mean, according to what I read, you know, I don't know everybody's view. Uh, Rigveda is the earliest text. Taitiriya, uh, the Yajurveda is the next earlier. Some Veda people have doubts, you know. Some people say it is Rigveda set to music. Uh, so it may be as old as the Rigveda. Now, my view is from the sophistication of the mathematics involved, both in this and in Rigveda, uh, I draw certain tentative conclusions. One of them is that there is a lot of overlap between them. That is to say, there are parts of the Yajurveda which are probably older than the Rigveda. I think the ritual parts of Yajurveda are definitely older. And all the numbers come in connection with rituals. Okay. Sacrifices and rituals are where the numbers come. They are not given as, uh, you know, so and so sold so many cows for so many bricks. No, you know. Cows and bricks will come, but uh, not in the commercial context, but in a sacred context. So, uh, so I, my belief is that this kind of passage is generally primitive in the sense of being earlier than uh, the, the Rigveda numbers that we'll come to in a minute. Now, this is an absolutely fabulous thing. See, you know, what it says is that the real magic is not in the feet of cattle, or the four quarters, the real magic is in the number four. Okay, you put together everything, you know, completely incompatible, uh, dissonant objects, put them together and say, oh, cattle have four feet, the quarters are four, therefore, he, f he finds support in the quarters, he, the, the person who owns the cattle. Then, for them, they, yeah, ladled up four times, in that he offers what has been ladled up four times, he delights the meters. Then, the meters are four in number. These offerings to Savit, number eight, Gayatri has eight syllables. So what it does is to relate uh, the mundane activities as counted by the number of repetitions of that activity with what it is he is trying to propitiate. And obviously, I mean, Gayatri was a sacred object. Gayatri, the, the meter was a sacred object. So, uh, it, it makes very good sense from that point of view. Now, there is another list, before I come to the last sentence, there is another list in the, uh, a, in this, you know, this kind of thing is of course in many, many, many books, many chapters of the Taitiriya Samhita, also in the other version uh, of Yajurveda, uh, Vajasiniya. But Vajasini also has many numbers. Uh, I don't know it so well. This I have a complete translation, so I can read it very carefully. So the, uh, the, what happens is that there is a passage very famous, uh, which goes, which starts like this. Uh, May these bricks be cows for me, 
one and a hundred and a thousand and he says you know thousand sahasra ayuta niyuta he goes on like this then he comes to parartha if you count the powers and if you assume that he has missed nothing in the middle then <coughs> parartha is uh, one followed by 12 zeros 10 power 12 and the in the context is again matching you what you're doing is well, look i'm going to put a brick well give me for every brick i put there you give me a cow i'll put a hundred bricks you give me a hundred cows give me i put 10 to the 12 bricks but of course nobody puts 10 to the 12 bricks so it's very poetic very visionary and uh, it's, it's actually quite fascinating these texts so then i go to the next one yeah i said you know i wrote this all this fancy mathematical uh, uh, notation for the numbers all numbers any number whatsoever now that refers to a particular way of presenting a very abstract structure the abstract structure is the idea it comes from the idea that given any number i can find these coefficients n0 n1 n2 and so on and so forth up to the value of k i require depending on how big the number is this abstract structure is uh, i will call it's called the place value principle because these numbers go in fixed places in the uh, in in the indian uh, indian notation fixed sthana each of them has a depending on the sthana its value changes if it is in the sthana the first sthana 3 is 3 second sthana 3 is 30 and so on okay so this abstract principle that there is a way of decomposing any number into a series of finite sequence of numbers small numbers adya sankhya that is what i call the place value principle now the place value principle can have not only written representations as i have used in my slides you can have a nominal representation you can give them names like as we do that ekadvi etc up to nava then dasha vimshati trimshat chatvarimshat and so on and so forth up to 90 then shata so what you do is every power of 10 instead of shifting its position you give it a new name you suffix the name to the coefficient or you do it in other different ways so that you know exactly what the value of that Adya Sankhya is depending on the preceding or the following noun for the powers of 10 that's the so this is as complete as flexible and uh, in every way as perfect a system as writing it down it's a little bit of a nuisance if you want to write poetry because you know sometimes the names get very long so uh, otherwise it is perfectly all right and then other solutions were found for it now i call them atomic numerals for a reason which will become very clear uh, re become clear very soon so what you do is you promote when you multiply when you promote a number to the next position the the word the malayalam word used by yukti bhasha for this process this karetam karerunu is going to invade that place it's as though there are these slots waiting to be invaded by these uh, by this uh, adya sankhya so he says so and in fact similar words are used in sanskrit by uh, bhaskara the first already so the indian thinking is that till you supply it with a digit these places are empty and for this reason uh, the symbol used to denote an empty place that is to say which can be filled by any number is the same as the symbol used for zero which i'll come to also in a little while the, the shunya bindu now when you give them names you have to combine them in two different ways you have to first multiply the powers of 10 by the Adya Sankhya, by the atomic numerals. And then you have to add them together. Now these are all now words in a language, a living language. So you have to combine the words to give it new, give, to get to new words. Which means what? Which means grammar. You have to have rules. In particular, you have to have rules, uh, compositional rules which will distinguish between adding and multiplying and that is a very very major very difficult undertaking actually it's been uh, very tough so uh, 
So addition is fairly simple. Addition is, uh, you know, some conjunction. Na, uh, cha, sakam, various, various conjunctions. Except, except, except the numbers, the very small numbers like ekadasha and dvadasha and so on and so forth, in which the sandhi has been, the samasa has been completed by, uh, in every way, it's one word. Okay. Uh, that's because I think they are the earliest numbers. They had been given conventional names involving the, the two numbers, 1 and 10. And then it became, uh, for example, uh, I think Panini says somewhere that these are anomalous numbers. There are no rules for them. Okay. So anomalous. And the same is true of Vimshati and Trimshat and Chatvarimshat and so on and so forth. Especially things like Shastri and Ashiti and so on and so forth. There are, there are really no rules. In fact, Panini quotes the whole all the multiples of 10 and then he says in the, the Vritti says that well you know these are anomalous uh, don't ask the reason why they are so these are exceptions so uh, the what you have to do now is to distinguish between the additive composition and the multiplicative composition and that is not easy at all it's not easy at all I mean there are many many sources of ambiguity uh, finally we said what we'll do is Hagishri Babre is the one who did the dirty work. The, 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 the idea of looking at Rigveda is mine. It's easy. So, uh, she's, she's very good. And uh, so what we said, we, after several months of, uh, you know, uh, hitting this impasse, we didn't know what to do. How do I tell them apart? And we were confused by the fact that uh, Aryabhata's three substantive books, three substantive pada. Uh, the three quarters, the Ganita, uh, Kalakriya and Gola, uh, they have 108 verses. The Gitika has 13 verses. So these are often referred to in the literature of Aryashtashata. Okay. Also they are in the Vrta Arya. So Aryashtashata meant the three chapters, the three solid chapters of Aryapatiya. Now if you look at the earlier writings on this, Colbrook who started Indological studies of uh, astronomy and mathematics, translates this as 800. Yeah. Burgess, who first translated, after spending a long time in India, translated the Surya Siddhanta, also says 800. Okay. But the Aryapatiya at that time was unknown. The text was only known by hearsay, by mentions in the Surya Siddhanta and also in Brahmagupta. Brahmagupta's writings. So this being the case, it was natural. Ashtashada, oh 800. 800 Ashtashada was done. Why is it not 800? Why is it 108? Now, it's 108 because if it were 800, you have to write it. Now I'm talking about something which, which I can be exposed very easily. <laughs> Ashtashada. Why is Ashtashada 800, not 800? Ah, that's what I'm saying. Linguistically, that's why I'm not willing to talk about it. <laughs> Linguistically, it is not. Uh, we checked it with many people, many experts, and you can, you can correct us again, all of you. Uh, if it were 800, it would have been given in two words, ashta, shata. And the reason for that is that 800 is the repetition eight times of the act of counting. Okay, this is what I understood at that time. And that kind of adverb, it's an adverb, because it's going to be ashta, shata, let's say cows. Okay. So the whole thing is an adjective, and this qualifies the first adjective, shata, and this is an adverb. It is what uh, Uma Vaidya translated for us as repetitive adverb, avruti vachaka. So uh, the reason for that is that in all declensions, and if I want to say, uh, if I use the, this 800 cows as an object in, as in the accusative case, for example, or the genitive case, then the declensions will apply to both words, ashta and shata. This is my understanding. Could be wrong. Okay? Don't take me seriously. But the point is, you can see it's a very important question. Till this pro question was solved, we suspended our work and said, we don't know that the Rigveda writers, the poets of the Rigveda, really understood the principles of decimal uh, numbers. After this we knew, they knew. 
they had a perfect understanding of the thing. There are two or three uh, difficult cases. Uh, when you get, the amazing thing is, the amazing thing is, uh, you can sort it out mostly with Padini's help. Because I think he analyzed, uh, you know the thing is, the Rigvedic principles, grammatic principles, I understand from people I talk to, uh, had a pretty, pretty uh, non-contradictory sense of grammar. That is to say, uh, it is not as though Panini came and told us that, you know, if there are two rules and they conflict, this has precedence over this. It is not that. They already had it in practice. And I think uh, the Vedic literature, especially in the later forms, Padapata or the Pratishakyas, for example, had was the raw material on the basis of which Panini actually uh, systematized with grammar. When uh, Patanjali says in Mahabharsha that, no, he is describing, he is not prescribing, he is describing the language that was spoken in Aryavarta at that time. What he means by Aryavarta is what was happening in Bihar. Okay? The, uh, the, uh, all the people who were concerned with, uh, you know, because they split and spread and they had to remember everything back again. So the Pratishakyas had to be memorized. So there is a combination of both bringing back the substance of the text as well as the tricks of memory by which you can preserve the text. So it's a, it's a very fascinating subject. All of this, by the way, a great deal of uh, my way of looking at these things, I owe to a very great man. I already mentioned his name yesterday, Fritz Stahl. Fritz, I recommend his book called uh, Rituals and Mantra, Rules Without Meaning. The original American title was more dramatic. Rules Without Meaning, Rituals and Mantra. He changed the order. Banarsi Das, Motilal Banarsi Das said, no, 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 rules without meaning won't sell in India. Change the order. <laughs> so, so it's a, you know, it's, you know, you can see it's been an absolutely magnificent, marvelous journey, you know. You make, the, you make sense of things which you thought had no system to it. You know, it just grew. It just growed. Uh, not true. Everything is grammatically correct. A few exceptions. Sayana, always, you can always go to Sayana. And in one or two places, Sahana says, I don't know. He says so, when only regarding numbers. So, uh, one of the things I hope to persuade Bhagishri to do is, since numbers are, you know, very limited, there are only two kinds of way you can combine them, add and multiply. Okay. So, all these ambiguities in nominal composition, which people are still writing long papers on. No, I have it in my paper somewhere. Yeah. It is, we got it from Sayana. Bhagishri got it from Sayana, yeah. She checked, yeah. So, uh, so there is, I, I, the exact translation of what Sayana says, I have, I think, in the paper. Yeah. So, in any case, what time? I have another 20 minutes, easily. Yeah, oh, very good. So, uh, only thing is, get an ambulance, somebody. <laughs> end of two days like this. Yeah, fortunately, we have medical people here, so it's not so bad. <laughs> so, uh, so that's uh, it's an, an extraordinarily enriching experience to go through this, you know. And the thing is, I cannot convince my friends, especially my mathematician friends, how wonderful it's, no, it is to know that there are more ways than one of skinning a cat. You can put numbers in this order, you can give them names and you can make very good sense of them. You can do arithmetic very easily with it. But there are difficulties, there are handicaps, which we'll come to in a minute. Now, uh, Rigveda, the highest power of ten that comes is Ayuta, ten thousand. Uh, the word Niyuta, Arbuda, these are names later used for higher powers of ten, they occur. But uh, Professor Sayana says that these are not numbers. These are actually words which mean what they say. Rigveda Samhita is up to Ayuta. It actually has the words Niyuta and Arbuda, both. Which later in Taitiriya, that's what I mean by saying that Taitiriya, Taitiriya you know, it's, it's a peculiar mixture of the old and the new. So, uh, it's very, very, it's a very interesting object actually. So, this being the case, uh, Ayuta and Sahasra, the one before Ayuta, the thousand, uh, they have uh, they have a connotation of bigness because sahasra, that which possesses power. Ayuta, 
that which is not bound, no, not yuta, not yuta. So, uh, so they are big numbers for the Rigvedans, there's no doubt. Uh, the biggest number itself is 99,000. Navatir Nava Sahasra, I think. I have it there. So, uh, the question to ask is, what has happened between maybe, you know, 200 years, not more than that, between the Rigveda and the Taittiriya's lists of big numbers? To make them realize, I think it is a perfectly natural thing that if you say, you know, you have these numbers, how did you get from 1000 to 10,000? You multiply by 10. You multiply by 10,000 10, by 10, what do you get? You get another bigger number and so on. What do you have to do? You give them names because we don't know how to write. In the Vedic times, we didn't know how to write. So, uh, Taittiriya Samhita is actually quite remarkable because in book 7, this is book 4, this list is in book I am coming to that, I am coming to that man, I am coming to that, I will tell you. That is part of Sarva. Okay. So, uh, so the first intimation of the endlessness of numbers is, is there. Because in the seventh chapter, there is another list which does not agree for the same number, the same name. Always. There are. And so, <coughs> it goes on up to Loka, which if you count the normal way, it is 10 power 19. It's a very big number. So, uh, so that's the situation. Now, of course, what happened was that my feeling is, which I will justify uh, in a little while, that they are now exploring, you know, like kids let out to play in the beach. How far can I get into the water without getting drowned? That's what they, they, they're testing the waters. They're actually seeing, is there any end to it? And I will argue that they knew pretty well that there was no end to it, already in the Taittiriya. Now, of course, at that time, uh, subsequently, it became, bigness became a big issue in India. Everybody wanted everything big. The Jainas had enormous numbers. The Buddhists had even bigger numbers. Mahabharata has several lists of big numbers. Ramayana has a list which goes 10 to the 50 or 60 or something like that. Uh, the number of people in Rama's army, there is a count somewhere or the other. I don't know it myself, I, I, didn't, I haven't checked, but uh, it is there. So, uh, so, bigness became a big issue and it stopped. It rose and it stopped. The last really long list is in the Buddhist text Lalita Vistara. And Lalita Vistara list is famous because this is a test was given to Siddhartha, the future Buddha, uh, by a mathematician of Sudhodana's court called uh, Arjuna and the uh, test was what do you know do you know this do you know numbers do you understand numbers and the Bodhisattva huh? because that's how he's described in the text says yes I do so then he says tell me show me how you know numbers then he says he counts gives names of powers up to 10 to the 54 or 55 you know it's very difficult to be precise about them because you miss things when you count you sit down in front of a piece of paper in which this is printed, go through it, you make mistakes. Then you ask, you know, the person who got the whole list printed, how do I know he didn't make a mistake? And we'll find examples of very great people who made mistakes in this manner. So, uh, but in the same test, the, the numbers, the biggest numbers that occur are very interesting. I mean, for example, at one place, Siddhartha says, so uh, the total number of atoms in Magadha, and then he says, why Magadha in the whole of Bharata Varsha is greater than number, which is the total number of grains of sand in as many riverbeds as each riverbed has grains of sand. There are as many grains of sand. Now take as many grains of sand as there are grains of sand in each riverbed. In as many, the, take the number of sands of grain, the grains of sand in as many riverbeds as there are grains of sand in one riverbed. So, I'll tell you, let n be the number of sand, grains of sand in the Ganga beaches, n power n. So, uh, it's actually, it's, so it's wonderful, it's actually, lit as literature also, it's very nice. But among the other tests that he passes, he knew 64 uh, scripts, 64 scripts and this, you know, the Lelta Vistara, people don't know it's exactly. Some people think it was started in the 3rd century BC. 
The final form definitely is post Mahayana, so third or fourth century AD. Now, if it is in the earlier text, it's very interesting to know this reference to 64 scripts because third century BC is when the Brahmi script first came to use in India, as far as you know, same time. Now we come to Sarva. The second Taittiriya list ends, actually ends after saying, you know, the Swaha for all the numbers. It is not an exchange of bricks for cows. Then he says, Sarvasmai Swaha. And before that, there is a second, a, about seven or eight lists, you probably remember, seven or eight lists of numbers, which are not big numbers, which are small numbers, which begin in the following way, one, two, three, up to a hundred, then one, three, uh, what have I quoted there? Uh, Ekasmai Swaha, Tribhya Swaha, Panchabhya Swaha, then it names every single number up to Ekanna Shataya Swaha, A99, then he says Shataya Swaha, then it says Sarvasmai Swaha. Every single list is ended with this, ends with this coda, Sarvasmai Swaha. Now I stop and ask myself, you know, what does it mean? Uh, as far as I'm concerned, well, you know, they, get to, they got tired after a while. You have, now, Swaha, uh, Keith translates as hail. Uh, swaha, is, swaha is the offering, no? It's the offering. So my view is that he's counting the offerings. Okay, I think so. So in that case, Sarva has a numerical meaning. Ever all. And I think this is now a proxy. It's a proxy for the totality of all numbers. Because you can't get there by playing tricks with numbers, you know. You know, you're, you're playing tricks. It's like, it's very much like Pradishakya. You play gymnastics with the syllables there. Here you play gymnastics with the numbers. Okay. But play with them as you will. There is no end to, the, end to numbers. So, all right. So we call it a day. We say, all right. I say, all right, Sarvasmai Swaha, excuse me, I can't name you all, there is no time. Now, the striking thing is that uh, in Indian mathematics, infinity is not a number. It is not a number, it cannot be a number because there is no such number. It has no name. It's used only adjectivally. It's an adjective and the adjective is generally Ananta. Now, there are others, Asankhya, you know, such names, such, such numbers are there, such names are there. But uh, Ananta is very common. Of course, the trouble is, if you have 500 names, you will tend to forget them. Uh, you know, we, we were prodigious in our memory powers, but even then, you forget them. It's proved by the fact that the list of powers of 10, two lists are never the same. The variations in the numbers, variations in the names, the variations in the matching of the name to number, and so on and so forth. And the most amusing thing, you know, you asked me about uh, Sayana, where he says that he doesn't know. Uh, here is an example of somebody who didn't know, another example of somebody who didn't know. Uh, Vasubandhu, it, you know, all texts had something to do with numbers, you know, even many Purana, later Purana texts have lots of numbers in them. And Vasubandhu says, he gives says that, yeah, here are the list of the 80th, 80 powers of 10, and he gives a list. And then, how many, 80 or 60, 60. Uh, then he says, he only gives 52. Uh, then he says, the other eight uh, have been lost to memory. Vismrutam. He says so, Vismrutam. Lost to memory. So memory was a major, major resource in all these things. So, uh, now at this time of confusion, to make things worse, actually, Professor Eliade will, I hope, excuse me. I think he made things worse. Yeah. There came Bhartruhari on the scene. Because, you know, uh, Vasubandhu and Bhartruhari are probably contemporaries and probably contemporaries of Aryabhata, 5th century, 6th century. Bhartruhari is probably 6th century, I don't know. Certain, uh, Vasubandhu certainly was because we know that when the Gupta kings founded Nalanda, that is 15 years after Takshashila was destroyed by the Hunas, Vasubandhu moved from Takshashila to Nalanda. Vasubandhu is mentioned as the rector of Nalanda at one time. So, uh, so this is, is a, so I, I like this passage very much. Just as grasping the first numbers, this is Adya Sankhya, the, uh, to my knowledge, the first use of this word. 
the numbers one to nine is the means to understand numbers which are different from them, or that is, which are larger than them because these are the smallest. So is the hearing of other words dependent on the first words. The words are heard, not read. Please notice, words are heard, they're not read. The gloss explains, you know, there is this gloss which some people say was written by him, I don't know. Uh, as the numbers, one, etc., serving different purposes are the means of understanding numbers like a hundred, thousand, etc., and are considered a constituent. The word used is avayava. Elsewhere, for the same idea, he uses the word anu and paramanu. So, sometimes I call them atomic numbers, sometimes I call them ajisankhya, so first numbers. So is the apprehension of a sentence based on the precise meaning of words such as Devadatta, the understanding of which is inherent. Don't ask me why Devadatta means what it means in a sentence. You have to know. This is one of the issues which keeps coming up, you know, the, all these ontological discussions, discussions of reality of various kinds and so on and so forth. How do we know the first things? How do we know that the aksharas have the pronunciation that they evoke, that they evoke in our minds when we see them? How do we know the numbers one to nine mean precisely what we mean by them? How does it express intrinsically the fiveness of five? Uh, I think this is a very serious issue. And there's been a lot of discussion on the nature of reality in this conference. And I think uh, we are nowhere near the end of understanding this problem. I think it probably has, you know, we can only approximate to the truth slowly, gradually. We'll never ever say, uh, ever be able to say that, uh, yeah, that's what we mean by truth or reality or whatever. So anyhow, Bhartrayar is very clear. I mean, he was, he was an amazing man, no? He, uh, Everything. He's a philosopher, he's a philologist, he is a cognitive theorist, everything that you can think of. Yeah, he also, he did, he did a disservice by his, uh, by his uh, insistence that things don't exist unless they have names. There is no cognition in this world in which the word, the word, Shabda, does not figure. All knowledge, Jnana, is intertwined with the word. No word, no knowledge. So, for numbers to exist, in some sense or the other, in Parthruhari's world, they must have a name. Now, this is an impossible bind to be in, because numbers have no end. So, you have to have an infinite number of names in order to be able to say, I understand numbers very well. This is part of the in-between thing. There is, the in-between cannot really be grasped. You can give a name Sarva to the limit, but what is in between will remain forever elusive. We will never be able to grasp it. So, uh, so this was very well understood. That is my point. Already from the time of the Taitiriya Samhita. So I, you know, since nothing exists without having a name, Parthruhari's theory must have a name if it is to exist. So I don't know what this Sanskrit is, what would you call Parthruhari's, this particular idea that uh, Shabda is a necessary precondition for existence of abstract things. There is an explosive, explosive event that takes place both in the speaker's mind and in the hearer's mind. Because I formulate a certain thing in a, an act of creation. I utter a sequence of sounds. Other people hear it and it provokes in their minds a flash of recognition. So, previous knowledge is necessary. I mean, you made this point yesterday. Uh, so, I personally think that without previous knowledge, without memory, uh, there is no knowledge, theory of knowledge is possible. I don't think so. Because memory, we don't pay too much attention to it because we say it is the, the province of the psychologists. Uh, but actually, without it, epistemology cannot exist, in my view. Anyhow, we go on. Now, uh, I come to my favorite book on Indian mathematics. Uh, it really is one of the great classics of the mathematical universe uh, of all times, Yukti Bhasha. Yukti Bhasha, after having given, in the very beginning of the book, you know, before he touches on anything very, very difficult, he gives a list of uh, Bhaskaracharya's list from Lilavati of the first 18 powers of 10 up to Paratha. Then he says, thus, 
if we endow numbers with multiplication, multiplication here means multiplication by 10. And positional variation, that when you multiply by 10, it shifts one place to the left. There is no end to the names of numbers. Hence, we cannot know all the numbers themselves and their order. Uh, I'll first say what he says in Malayalam. He says, Sankheda perka avasanam illai gayal sankhagal tangaleyum avetteende kramatteyum arinyu kuda. So it is in Sankheda, Avetta. You know, this is, this is a bazaar Malayalam, you know, in a certain sense. So, uh, see, Yukti Basha is actually very, very straightforward. It's very easy to understand the language. Not difficult at all. Uh, but what he says is, what he says is truly from our present point of view, very revolutionary because this is very Bhartruharian. If they don't have names, we cannot talk about them. We cannot, we cannot, we don't know them. That's what he says, you know. There is no end to the numbers because there is no end to the names of numbers. The names first, the objects later. Uh, it's a very, very, for me it's very, I mean, when I first read it, I was very disturbed. No, I think here, uh, constructionism is a uh, constructionism is very modern, very, very uh, highly, but I don't think this goes so far. I don't say, for example, there are many processes, mathematical processes in the Yuxi Vasha itself, uh, which have no, uh, uh, you don't actually construct things. You say that this is possible, like for example, this division by infinity, which I'll come to, which I, if I have time, I'll come to it. But the thing is, what he says very clearly, first you have to have a name, so it is nominalism. Yeah, but this is, no, no, but you must remember this is after writing numbers became very commonplace in India. He himself, at certain places, he writes numbers. Sankhede perk avasanam illai gayal sankhagal tangaleyum avetinde kramateyum aranyoda. No Sanskrit in it. Kramam, <laughs> Sankhya, <laughs> two Sanskrit words. I mean, I think it had a very, very strong hold. And I think in Jeshtadeva's mind, uh, I think Madhava did not worry too much about philosophical questions. In Jeshtadeva's mind, I think you can see Jeshtadeva was a disciple of Nilakantha. It's very clear. But he's concerned with foundational questions, you know. Several places in the book, very, very deep foundational questions, which really are very modern in spirit, uh, which of course I will not talk about. Uh, Madhava simply went and did what he had to do. Now, when you cannot list them, when you uh, cannot enumerate them, when you cannot name them, what do you do? What you do is, you formulate rules which will apply to every member of a set. Whether the set has two members or an uncountably large number of members. Uh, to every single one of them they'll apply. This is what I call the Paninian method because what you do is you categorize them into a finite number of objects, sets, and you give them names, the famous meta, meta linguistic markers, and you say the rules apply to the markers, to the whole set. Like in Sandhi, for example, you know, you say R and E is A, doesn't matter which words these R and E occur, it doesn't matter. So that's one way, you know, you can have an infinite number of words. One ending with I and beginning with A, you can bring them together. I don't have to get into this hassle with infinity to describe it. So categorical description is one solution to this. And the astonishing thing is, everybody, every mathematician learned Sanskrit grammar, at least in the beginning. Okay? Not a single one of them used Paninian tricks in their mathematics. It's very, very difficult to understand. It only became fashionable because some Western scholars said, Oh, this is axiomatic set theory without axioms. That's what Manini did. You know, you divide, I mean, apart from many other creative things, I mean, he, the, the, for me, the fundamental thing is, there are two things. One is the categorical description of linguistic objects. Secondly, the categorical description of the rules they obey, from where it is only one step to say that the sets are defined by the rules they obey which is a very, very, very abstract way of looking at it. But effectively, that is what Paninian grammar is. Categories are determined by the rules they obey. Anyhow, that's a different question. Now, in the, uh, there is a, 
Somebody mentioned uh, Brihaspati today? No. Indra. Indra came up somewhere. No, you mentioned. <laughs> you know this? No, somebody mentioned Mahabharsha. Patanjali. Patanjali has a story in Mahabharsha about how to learn a language. Then he says, you know, I will, I will ex tell you the following story about Indra and Brihaspati. Indra, being an illiterate man, very powerful, he wanted to learn to be civilized. So he went to Brihaspati and said, teach me language. So after this, looked at the linguistic units, aksharas and the words and so on, one after the other, at the end of a thousand years of the gods, they still didn't make any progress. Okay. And Patanjali says, this is not the way to learn language. To learn language, you must have rules. You must have rules, both general and particular. And of course, it's from, from our point of view, it's very simple because, you know, language is also of infinite potential. There is no end to the, you know, the, the basic, basic point is that you take a finite set of elements, you have a finite number of rules, you combine them according to the rules, respecting the rules, there is no end to the number of structures you can create. Numbers are one example, a literary composition is another, another example, finite number of words, finite number of grammatical rules, carry on. So uh, that, that is the insight which made an enormous difference. The other, the other thing is something which came up also several times in this meeting, uh, recursive methods. Recursive methods, you don't say this applies to the whole set, it doesn't matter whether it's smaller, uh, the number of objects in it is finite or large. What you do is, you take a typical element from the set, a, a recursive process according to uh, Fritz's, what he calls the everyman's definition, he said not technical, is uh, consists of an elementary process of which the in output can be fed as its own input. That you, you have, think of a black box, uh, you feed two numbers and the uh, output will be the sum of two numbers or you put two numbers, the output will be the ratio of the two numbers and the remainder, put them back in and go on and on and on and on and as long as it will go. Sometimes these processes end and uh, Aryabhata's great work, uh, the, the great step that he took forward is finite or cyclic recursive. At the end of 24 steps you come back to where you started with. Many recursive processes are endless, they go on for in, uh, forever. And this way of, uh, this way of making things more and more precise using this trick is called samskaram in uh, Malayalam, in Yukti Bhasha, uh, and similar names in other, other, other texts. There is a name for recursion uh, in the Sanskrit, I don't know. In the very general sense, no. There must be, there must be many words, I would guess. Nyaya has so many meanings, you know. I can only look at Monia Williams, so it has many meanings in Monia Williams, so I, I'm lost. <laughs> so, uh, so it's a, it's a very, uh, this method, according to Fritz, the roots of this lie in the structure of the, uh, the Vedic ritual and of the chants, the mantras which uh, uh, accompany them. Uh, because there are many, many tricks. You know, you, you want a small resource, you know, there are several words which occur in different mathematical contexts. One of them is uh, parivartana. In Narayana Pandita's work, the word parivartana occurs for certain operations which are repeated. Uh, there, the, the word occurs for the first time uh, in a pre-Vedic text from Syria. It's uh, called the Mithali kingdom, the, the what, Kakulis, Kakula, Kakuli, what's his name? The horse trainer. The man who trained horses, in which the first occurrence of Eka Tri Pancha occur, uh, dated 1400 AD BC. Uh, there, a circuit of the horse is called a Parivartana, because it is repeated many times. Parivartana. So, yeah. No, but it's repeated. No, no, recursion need not be a, a physical act. It can be an intellectual process, you know. Or it can be uh, like in the performing arts, it is actually an induction of a, of a repetitive process both on the stage where the performance takes place and in the observer's mind. So uh, I think we should not be too specific, that's what, what I feel.
Yeah, I've already said this. In all this, uh, very, very, very underappreciated roles are played by certain psychological things, cognitive, cognitive acts, uh, inference, memory, consensus. We must agree. We cannot be fighting over the meaning of nine. This is the, what's in between is between Eka and Sarva, because I have not come to Shunya yet. Shunya will take very little time. So this is what I mean by saying, you know, when Parthruhari says that Devadatta, whose understanding is inherent, I mean that it is something we know. It doesn't matter how we know it. That Devadatta is the subject of a syllogism, for example, masculine, singular. Nominative case, subject. So, uh, what else can it mean, inherent? What I mean by, what I mean here is that the knowledge of the meaning of the numbers one to nine, whether you write symbols for them, whether you call them panja, etc., that is something you have to know. How? By consensus among all of us, by actually looking at them enough times to memorize them completely. That's why. Children have to learn by rote, there is no other way. Children have to learn by rote. There is no way of learning the multiplication table except by learning it by heart. There is no other way. Shunya is, you know, compared to our struggles with understanding infinity, which finally was settled only with Madhva's work on calculus. I won't say it's somewhat technical how it is done, uh, because they, they actually had to use all the numbers between Parartha and Sarva, the, the, as big as possible. Uh, and they never had to bother about giving them names. They didn't bother. They just did it. <coughs> they said, take the limit. Now, the history of Shunya, in oral, in oral communication, I don't need zero. Okay? Uh, I don't, if I want to say there is no zero in uh, Rigveda, I will say there is no zero in Rigveda. I will not say there are zero zeros in Rigveda. I won't say there is no cow in this room. I will say, I will not say there are zero cows in this room. The first probable reference to a written zero is called... Oh, I didn't say that. The first mathematical zero, it's a very, very interesting uh, thing, uh, which is Pingala in uh, his Chandas Sutra. Uh, it's a very mathematical text. You know, it's a classification of the meters, all the Sanskrit meters, all possible theoretical Sanskrit meters. In this, at a certain point, in one of the Pratyayas, I think... Uh, Number four, in just to construct certain numbers, in the intermediate steps, two sets of numbers of them. And he uses the very particular device of giving them set names, metalinguistic marks. And what are the names he gives them? They're not uh, meaningless syllables like mm and so on and so forth. It is shunya and dvi. And dvi we know is two. So shunya is zero, it is a number, and that number can, on, can only be zero. So, the, the first ever mention of the zero as a number. And this is probably 3rd century BC. Pingala with the 2nd century BC, maybe. Nobody knows, really. The first written, written zero, first reference to a written zero, is probably in uh, Subandhu's uh, romance, Vasavadatta. Uh, the name used is Shunyabindu. The dot that is the zero. And uh, he compares the stars in the night sky to Shunya Bindus. That's what he. Had. That's where the context from which it comes. Actually, it's, it's it's very very interesting. I read a partial translation of that book not so long ago, and you know it is heavily ornamented Sanskrit. You know, it's unbelievable. It puts you off. It's not easy to. Uh. Oh, see the problem of use, problem of the hands. Yeah. The first written zero in the form of a dot, written now, actual existing written zero, is in something which was in the news about a month ago, the Bakshali manuscript, if you remember, in uh, BBC, on television, in, uh, in the Hindu, and so on and so forth. And that is something I have a little more to say in a minute. Uh, the Bakshali is a very remarkable document. Uh, the first zero in the form of a circle, the one we use now, it is from Cambodia in a Sanskrit inscription in which the reference is to Shakabda. And uh, the, the language, the, the script is Cambodian. 
the language is sanskrit uh, thing is but if you want to write numbers as we normally write you cannot do without a zero because if there is a zero missing and you don't write anything there then you will think that this number is one place of 10 shorter that won't do so you have to have a zero oral oral uh, number signs you don't need a zero third century bc the brahmi uh, script made its appearance in india nobody knows where it came from whether we invented it whether it came from outside somewhere or the other we don't know but in this the references to numbers in the brahmi inscriptions began only in the turn of the century a uh, turn of the millennium that is to say about 0 ad and that uh, is very remarkable because there are no zeros in brahmi numbers no zeros at all if you look at it more carefully you find that uh, for powers of 10 like 10 100000 there are single symbols therefore it is not a place value system it is not something in which you have to write 1 0 it is one symbol like shata or dasha or sahasra as you can see from that uh, thing now uh, this is means first of all it is not place value there is no zero there is none of these things what they are is a symbolic representation of the names of the numbers not of the numbers themselves it's a symbolic representation it's twice removed from the abstract number first you construct a perfectly legitimate decimal uh, nominal system for the numbers then you convert the symbols uh, you convert the words into arbitrary symbols completely arbitrary symbols so uh, so this is uh, brahmi numerals have been a puzzle for a very long time in fact a friend of mine and i once about 10 years ago uh, just for fun we went through all the coins with brahmi characters on them looking for a zero we didn't we didn't find any so we said you know they're foolish people they didn't have a zero actually you not know, they were very smart people so uh, so it's it's only in the last two years it became clear that this is what it is it is actually a symbolic representation of literary number names that's what they are so with this i will come to my the end of my talk pretty much now the bakshali manuscript uh, the very short introduction is a set of birch bark manuscripts on which a mathematical text has been written using ink and a brush brush is probably a twig uh, and uh, it has been in existence it has been known it has been in existence god knows since when it has been known to have been in existence since 1883 i think and it went to calcutta then it went to england then it went to oxford and it's been part of the bodleian collection for a very very long time and some foolish people at that time uh, packed them in between sheets of mica and it is impossible now to remove the mica without the writing coming off with it and for the last 10 years at least several of us including me been trying to persuade them that they should take a small scrap of this and date it uh, by radiocarbon because nobody knew how old the, the, the manuscript was the estimates range from zero the time of the beginning of the christian era up to 13th century that's 1300 years you would have thought that you know by looking at the script and looking at the language uh, they will be able to uh, zoom in on a sharper date but people said various things and uh, finally they have dated it the so dates have been quoted over a long time 0 to 1300 many many dates in fact one of them is actually in the first century bc that's what i'm saying you know the bbc now the guardian has a very long article uh, they have actually dated it they have taken three samples yeah yeah but they are they are the guesswork dates you know they guesswork dates hayashi who is the most serious scholar of the bakshali manuscript takao hayashi uh, he says seventh century and why why does he say seventh century from the script which is called sharada which is a variant of nagari no but the point is that you know what do you compare it with you have no other text from that time except on some stone uh, inscribed on stone but inscriptions on stone are not the same as writing on a bark you know they often there are serious differences because uh, cutting a rock is different from making a stroke with a brush uh, then the language itself is a variant of uh, 
Prakritic Sanskrit, people say. I don't know. So the dating gives three dates. It gives fourth, third, fourth century, about the seventh century, and about the ninth century. Uh, with errors of the order of a hundred years either way. Now this is, now the puzzle has become more serious because if, you, if the manuscript was prepared on birch bark, which was collected at the same time, you cannot get three different dates. So what is the origin of the mystery? We don't know. They seem to think, they seem to believe in the fourth century date, not in the other two. Now if you look at the mathematics, especially the history of the zero, uh, it's very, very clear that it is between 300 and 400 AD. Not only from the point of view of what it contains, but from the point of view of what it doesn't contain, which is contained in Aryabhatiya, which is not there. Okay, which should have been there, it isn't there. So, uh, so I'm very proud. Uh, three years ago I wrote, well, uh, on balance my judgment is 4th century AD. I felt very good. <laughs> very happy. So, uh, it's very important to date it correctly because, you know, last word, Madhava zero. There are two zeros, you know, it's, uh, people forget this fact that the zero which comes before one, that's one zero, the numerical zero. The zero which is the cardinality of the empty set. But there is another zero which is the, you can like, if you like, call it the reciprocal of infinity. What it means is that you take one over n, let n grow bigger and bigger and bigger, when 1 over n will go smaller and smaller and smaller till it will get as close to zero as you wish but it will never be zero because there is no n to numbers. Okay. This is the idea that is at the heart of Madhva's calculus. Now uh, this way of dealing with a zero as, uh, as a limit of a sequence uh, caused a tremendous amount of confusion everywhere. In Europe it wasn't sorted out till the 18th century. In India it was sorted out by Madhva. Bhaskaracharya got lost. So, uh, so this must be kept in mind. There are, uh, there's another sense to the number of zero, to the shunya, which isn't quite shunya, which is zero but not quite zero. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> no one slept and I think that's a big bonus. Actually, I had a lot of reservations. I remember only my mathematics classes in school. And I was wondering how I'm going to sit through this totally uh, obscure kind of a presentation which I thought it would be but you kept me absolutely riveted sir and I didn't know mathematics had these dimensions I wish you know some of my school teachers had gone through this training it would have been much more interesting seriously yeah. uh, that mathematics could be fun maybe that's something which we all missed out as he said no I don't think he knew better nobody was sleeping and I suppose there are questions. We have some time for interaction. Sundaration, sir. We have some time for interaction. Yes. We have a lot of time for interaction, apparently. So please come forth and make your... I, I started feeling guilty towards the end, so I forgot to say something, which is to formally thank this, the languages people here, especially the Sanskrit department, and especially the, of course, Professor uh, Sundareshwaran and his uh, team of helpers, because it's been a wonderful conference in every way, very stimulating. For somebody, you know, uh, essentially uncultured, uh, I got a lot out of this meeting. Uh, because, you know, the, everything, many things were sort of, you know, you had the feeling that if you had to know it better, you can. I didn't have the feeling, normally I don't have the feeling when I go to an uh, ancient Indian culture conference that, you know, uh, I can actually be interested in this. This time I had the feeling, in fact one of the things I'm going to do is, I have, I don't have the translation you mentioned, but I have Valyatan's translation of Charaka Samhita. I'm going to go back and look at it. Yeah, I'm going to, going to go back and look at it. You know, it's been an absolute mind-blowingly open meeting. I, well, I enjoyed it myself very much. So. Thank you very much, formally on behalf of the speakers and all the participants here. How do you cognize numbers? How do I? Cognize numbers. So, uh, this is something I didn't talk about. Uh, you know, uh, you don't mind my answer being a little longer than anybody expects. 
there is a reason. Because there is a tremendous amount of work going on now, now, on the cognition of numbers by psychologists, neurobiologists, and various other people. And I've read some of the stuff. And uh, the basic problem for them is they think that what we have inherently is an ability to judge approximately a number. Given a pile of objects, approximately how many? No, here is Sumara to Parim. Ah, there is a new Sumara, a new Runda, a little I don't know Parim. But uh, I don't think uh, that is good enough, in my view. I think what is true is that the way we cognize numbers is very, very strongly limited by the choice we make for the base, 10. Now, 10 is, uh, it occurs in many, many contexts in the numbers around 10. The Indus Valley people counted it in base 8. Then, uh, if you look, you know, there is, a, if you ask a musician, uh, how many beats does a particular tala have? Generally speaking, it varies between 6 to 16. In Hindustani system, 16 is normally the largest. People who want to show off will do complicated things. But generally speaking, uh, 6 rupak and up to 16, which is tintal. Uh, and I think the reason is that uh, we don't cognize the magnitude of the number. We actually cognize the pattern. We, what we cognize is the pattern. It's like looking at playing cards. Nobody, every time he, you get a playing card, you don't count to see how many there are. You know. How do you know? Firstly, because you have a memory. When you were a kid and playing cards for the first time, you have actually counted and you know how many there are. And the, after that, you have this big, enormous memory in our heads in which there is an association of a precise notion of the number with either the pattern or the pattern in space or in time. Like in music, it is in time. In, uh, in visual pattern recognition, it is in space. Uh, I think that is, that is the issue on which uh, I invoke Agni. Uh, he who sees minutely and precisely, uh, he who can see, he who can see uh, objects which are far away. So it's a divine gift. So for me, inherent in the sense in which Bhartrahari uses it is what the Rigveda calls a divine gift from Agni. Because Agni is the god of light and number. Now you must remember, uh, this is not uh, unique to India. Prometheus, when he stole fire, he also stole the art of numbers. He brought it to men. He stole it from the gods and he brought it to the mortals. So uh, the idea that the idea that there is a correlation in our minds between light, Agni as the Lord of Light, not of fire, not of not the hot fire, Lord of Light and the ability to count precisely. Then there is Uham This is I personally think it's a very reasonable thing. There are many reasons why I think it is true, but uh, it could be wrong. I could be wrong. I personally think it is that. After that, I don't need to know. I don't need to have an inherent sense of numbers. I have rules, rules without meaning. I have rules which have no meaning whatsoever outside the context in which I... And they are rules without meaning, but they are not rules without purpose. There is a reason why we make these rules. That is to uh, facilitate our act of recognition of numbers in a precise way. But if you were to ask, you know, last, last uh, part of the remark, uh, if I were to tell you that the gravitational wave that has recently been uh, fourth time identified comes from an object from which is one followed by let us say 13 zeros kilometers away it means nothing to us to most of us it means nothing at all it might have been just 1.3 million years uh, light years it need not be uh, so far away so uh, there is always a limit to our inherent ability with or without the help of rules if there are rules, we can do things much better without any rules. Without rules, our ability is very strictly limited, very strictly limited. 
and that that's why uh, wherever so you ask a musician you know when you are uh, singing a very slow movement uh, nalap in vilambit kal a hindustani musician uh, they will s you ask them you know do you know uh, when you reach this point which is the ninth matra or the 11th matra and he or she will say yes i know precisely i said what do you do it's in my head so you know it's this sort of the embodiment of the mind and the embodiment is in the ear this time not yeah no they don't even do that i mean they don't need to do that they do it sometimes but they don't need to do that i mean they know i mean a certain uh, a certain uh, syllable occurs in the or a certain shift in the in the in the swara occurs they know that happens at the ninth matra so uh, so i think the number cognition uh, is a fascinating subject i have written a small note actually on the subject number cognition itself well uh, just just before the uh, during the interval i was just mentioning this to nizar and the intriguing thing is we were mentioning tala again aha uh -huh. and how uh, two things what one in continuation of what you said pi ambattar akshara kalam nu orinna oru oru segment varumbo അതായത് ഒരു ഒരു കാലവട്ടം എന്നുള്ളത് ആദ്യകാലാണെങ്കിൽ ഒമ്പത് അടികൾ വരുന്ന ഒരു കാലവട്ടം അതിൻ്റെ സ്പേസ് എക്സ്റ്റെൻഡ് ചെയ്യുമ്പോൾ അതിനകത്ത് അമ്പത്താറ് അക്ഷരങ്ങൾ വയ്ക്കാൻ പറ്റാവുന്ന സ്പേസാണ് അപ്പോൾ ടൈമിനെ അവിടെ കണക്കാക്കുന്നത് ഓരോ അക്ഷരങ്ങളുടെ അല്ലെങ്കിൽ ശബ്ദം എന്നുള്ള അർത്ഥത്തിൽ അക്ഷരങ്ങളുടെ സ്പേസ് അപ്പോൾ അമ്പത്താറ് അക്ഷരങ്ങൾ ചേർന്ന് വരുന്ന ടോട്ടൽ ടൈം സ്പേസാണ് അതിൻ്റെ ഉള്ളിൽ കൂടിയാണ് ഈ എട്ടടിയും ഒന്ന് വിടലുമായിട്ടുള്ള ഒമ്പതെണ്ണം ആയി വരുന്നത് അപ്പോൾ ഇത് ആസ് യു സെറ്റ് ഇത് പിടിക്കുകയോ അല്ലെങ്കിൽ എണ്ണി നോക്കിയിട്ട് ഒന്ന് രണ്ട് മൂന്ന് എണ്ണി നോക്കിയിട്ടല്ല ഇതൊരു ഒരു പാറ്റേണായിട്ട് ഒരു ശബ്ദത്തിൻ്റെ പാറ്റേണോ അല്ലെങ്കിൽ കാലിലുള്ള പാറ്റേണോ അല്ലെങ്കിൽ കൊട്ടുന്നതിൻ്റെ പാറ്റേണോ ഒരു പാറ്റേണായിട്ടത് സ്ട്രക്ചറേഷനായിട്ട് നിൽക്കുന്നുണ്ട് പക്ഷേ രസം എന്നുള്ളത് ആസ് യു സെറ്റ് ഈ നോമൻ ക്ലേച്ചർ കൊടുക്കുന്ന അതായത് വാക്ക് അക്ഷര സോറി നമ്പറിന് സംഖ്യയ്ക്ക് പേര് കൊടുക്കുന്ന ഒരു സമ്പ്രദായം പറഞ്ഞുവല്ലോ ഓൾമോസ്റ്റ് വെരി സിമിലർ ടു ദാറ്റ് താളത്തിൻ്റെ കാര്യം വരുമ്പോൾ ഒന്ന് രണ്ട് ഇപ്പോൾ വെസ്റ്റേണിൽ ചിലപ്പോൾ അല്ലെങ്കിൽ ഇന്ന് ഇന്ന് പഠിപ്പിക്കുന്നതിലും വൺ വൺ ടു ത്രീ വൺ ടു ത്രീ എന്ന് പറയുന്നുണ്ട് പക്ഷെ ഇവിടെ തക തരിക്കിട്ട തക തകിട്ട തക തകിട എന്ന് പറഞ്ഞ് ആ ആ നോമൻ ക്ലേച്ചർ അവിടെ കൃത്യമായിട്ട് വരുന്നുണ്ട് നമ്പേഴ്സ് അല്ല ഇൻറ്റേണലൈസ് ചെയ്യുന്നത് of the uh, the avartana of the uh, of the syllables and the difference between the numbers are indicated by the difference in the in the sounds which are allotted to each of them yeah. dha will be different from ka yeah ri will be different from dha yeah. in the sense that the the pressure or the whatever uh, associated with that will be different just as ഒന്ന് രണ്ടിൽ നിന്നും ഡിഫറെൻ്റ് ആവുന്ന പോലെ ഓൾമോസ്റ്റ് ലൈക്ക് ദാറ്റ് സോ ഐ എം ക്വൈറ്റ് ഇൻട്രീക് ബൈ ദ വേ ഇൻ വിച്ച് അൺകോൺഷ്യസ്ലി അറ്റ് ലീസ്റ്റ് ഇൻ പ്രാക്ടീസ് ഇഫ് നോട്ട് ഇൻ തിയറി അറ്റ് ലീസ്റ്റ് ഇൻ പ്രാക്ടീസ് ദ സെയിം പ്രിൻസിപ്പൽ സീംസ് ടു ആക്ച്വലി സീപ് ഇൻ ടു എ നമ്പർ ഓഫ് ഡിഫറെൻറ്റ് ഐ തിങ്ക് സോ ഐ ഇൻ ഫാക്ട് ഐ വാസ് ടോക്കിംഗ് ടു ഡോക്ടർ രാം മനോഹർ ഐ സി മെനി മെനി പാരലൽസ് ഇൻ ഫാക്ട് ഐ സെറ്റ് ദാറ്റ് ഐ ഗുഡ് ഗോ ബാക്ക് ആൻഡ് ലുക്ക് അറ്റ് ചരക്ക സംവിധ അഗൈൻ ബിക്കോസ് Uh, i knew that there was a lot of epistemology in uh, charaka's writing but you know i ayurveda is a very difficult subject i keep away from it so uh, but these points and also similar questions came up uh, in discussions of logic here it came up in the discussion of performing arts by you yesterday so what is it that we have inside us where does that come from uh, it came also in the talk of uh, dr shrinivas today Uh, when you say i mean you ask the question what about preparing for the vada but we are always prepared up to a point because we cannot unknow what we know we cannot and so that is why in one of the slides i did mention uh, for me a critical question is the role of memory the role of consensus you know it's not enough for me to know things you know i can i can think that i I have the ultimate theory of the universe in my head but nobody will believe me so I have to convince other people and there we use various means of communication all of which have a strong element of the linguistic in it we cannot communicate without language 
വെരി സ്പെഷ്യലൈസ്ഡ് ഏരിയാസ് വെരി സ്പെഷ്യലൈസ്ഡ് പീപ്പിൾ പറഞ്ഞതുപോലെ തരികട എന്ന് പറഞ്ഞാൽ അതിൻ്റെ അർത്ഥം എല്ലാ കുട്ടികൾക്കും ഉടനെ മനസ്സിലാവും ബട്ട് ജനറലി സ്പീക്കിംഗ് ഇറ്റ് ഈസ് ലാംഗ്വേജ് ലാംഗ്വേജ് മെമ്മറി ആൻഡ് ഇൻ ദ കേസ് ഓഫ് നമ്പേഴ്സ് ഇൻ ദ കേസ് ഓഫ് ദി അറ്റോമിക് നമ്പേഴ്സ് ദി ആദ്യ സംഖ്യ വാട്ട് വി റിമെമ്പർ ആർ ദി അസോസിയേഷൻ വിത്ത് ദി നെയിം ഓഫ് ദ നമ്പർ സപ്ത എന്ന് പറഞ്ഞാൽ ഇറ്റ് ഈസ് സെവൻ സെവൻ ഐ നോ സം പീപ്പിൾ സി സെവൻ പിപ്സ് ഓൺ എ പ്ലേയിങ് കാർഡ് വെൻ ഐ സേ സെവൻ ഐ ഡോൺ എൻ എക്സ്പെരിമെൻറ്റ് വിത്ത് ചിൽ ലിൽ ചിൽഡ്രൻ യു നോ പീപ്പിൾ ഹു ഹാവ് ജസ്റ്റ് ബിഗൺ ടു ലേൺ അബൌട്ട് നമ്പേഴ്സ് സോ വാട്ട് ഐ ഡൂ ഇസ് വാട്ട് ഐ ഡിഡ് ബോസ് ഐ ടേക്ക് എ പ്ലേയിങ് കാർഡ് സ്നിപ്പ് ഓഫ് ദി റിട്ടൺ നമ്പർ സെവൻ ഓൺലി ദ പാറ്റേൺ ഇസ് ലെഫ്റ്റ് ഐ ഷോ ഇറ്റ് ടു ദം ഇൻ എ ഫ്ലാഷ് ഐ സേ ഓൾ ഐ റൈറ്റ് ഡൗൺ വെൻ ഐ ഷോ ഇറ്റ് യു വാട്ട് കാർഡ് യു സോ വാട്ട് നമ്പർ they the kids fall very clearly into two groups those who don't make any mistakes at all those who make plenty of mistakes because they haven't had time to count then i said i each of them i asked have you played cards before the guys who got them right every time had played cards so this is uh, now but the psychology experiments are extremely extremely unreliable because they think that it's connected with our perception of space i don't think so i think it is much more abstract than that i don't think it is very concrete uh i think the uh, the tr- trouble with physiologists and uh, psychologists who def- depend on the physiology of the brain is uh, that they take everything very literally they give no room for the the intangible uh, connections we make in our mind most of which we reject because they're not viable the ones we keep are what will serve us in the future just look at a kid looking at a new object for the first time look at the eyes you can see you can see the shine coming you know? <laughs> i've done this kind of thing many times so uh, where in the other to i don't know whether this uh, question uh, actually makes sense see number as a uh, something that people ancient people i mean indian ancient mathematicians i'm talking about them i mean uh, how do they it's not a matter of cognition or what language they how linguistically they grasp etc that's not the question i was i, I was raising the late uh, earlier how do they uh, bring this notion of number into their experience okay together with other things that they experience about the world for example what what number is to them is it for example do they believe that number exists apart from for example you can look at numbers as instrumentally that you have some a purpose is served by using numbers but it is also it may also be the case that you believe in number you know you the number like like spoda and the spoda siddhanta you know there no logo logos that is a before spoda they believe in the ver- word the word exists even without or independent of any connotation th- it might have yeah pardon without any connotation it might have yeah the word exists as a unit of sound yeah exactly Shabda. yeah like that yeah. similarly number for example ontologically for example what is the ontological status number according to the ancient mathematic uh, mathematician in india one thing like for example you mentioned a nominalism there no that's why i asked that time because so after some time i may not be able to ask the same <laughs> question so i immediately asked the question that is so there is an in brewer's intuitionism you know very well that is intuition means human construction you know it is something that human construct it it the number is only uh, meaningful in the framework of or in the human conceptual field beyond that there is nothing like that nothing like number so in the case of this nominal ism that you said see logical nominal ah this this very, this very in- unproud of that term sorry sorry <laughs> this infinite the infinity or num- notion of infinity yeah. only the thing is that you have to the existence of this is dependent on how you name it isn't it every mom- according to ac- the nominalism yeah like that yeah. so nominalism so this means what this means by no- naming it you are constructing it this this no. notion no 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 look, let me no 
I know the other side of yeah. the story, but I am thinking in that way. Yeah, I so mean, I, I, think, I think there is no good answer to such questions. I, my, feel, my feeling is that uh, at the end, at the end, I don't say at the end of the day because everybody says at the end of the day, uh, but this is the end of the day for us. At the end, it is enough that we agree. I mean, how do you know, how do I know that your idea of a gr green leaf and my idea of a green leaf are the same idea? We have possibly no way of, uh, of saying that it is the same idea because it is, uh, I mean, I think my view is that uh, all knowledge is collective knowledge. If you do not communicate, if you do not receive, if you do not transmit uh, what I know to be true of this world in which we live, I think uh, we cannot possibly create an exact science or even hope to create an exact science. So number, number, I'll come back to this question of number. Uh, most mathematicians are instrumentalists in your language. Uh, I say they are abstract mathematicians in the sense that for them the number is defined by what it does. What properties does it have? Like uh, Pratyaya in grammar, uh, it's, its function defines it. Okay. You may give it a name, you may give it a sound, uh, but what, is, what it actually is, what does it do in a given context? So that's enough. I don't need to know more. Indian mathematicians I'm talking about. Most mathematicians, most Indian mathematicians, certainly Aryabhata did not write anything on it, but he wrote very little in any case. Now, who else can we expect to write on such a thing? There are not too many mathematicians or astronomers who wrote Bhaskaracharya we might have expected. Ah, Bhaskaracharya, you see, Bhaskaracharya is a very peculiar case, a very, very peculiar case, because for him, numbers are fundamentally, primarily defined as a precursor to Bija Ganita, and that's correct. You know, a good meaning for zero or negative numbers cannot be given outside an algebraic framework. You cannot do it very well. And mathematicians have written on it, and I agree with them. So he, for him, it's a very short introduction in uh, two numbers in the Bija Ganita. Uh, Lilavati, there is a longer introduction which is not very, very uh, enlightening. Bija Ganita, uh, what is interesting is what he does with the symbols. He says, uh, Avyakta Rashi will have to be used because we don't know the answer to questions and we have to have something to represent it. So for this, following Brahmagupta, we can use the names of colors, Varna. Okay. Ka for Kalika, Ni for Nilika, and so on and so forth, Tamra, and so on and so forth. But if you look at the book, you go and after that you read the rest of the book, there is not a single place where he has used not only not the name of the color, and not even the abbreviation he suggests, that is to say, the first syllable. He never uses it. He will actually describe the problem in a narrative fashion using words. So, uh, possible that behind the scenes when he went home and he was thinking of new mathematics, he did this with this. But in public presentations, no sign of symbolic language, no sign. It's a very, very confusing for the first reader. The person who really talked about it, thought about it, is Jeshadeva. Jeshadeva actually has a definition of numbers and how is it defined for him? It is defined by the property of succession and precedence. He will say, uh, the succeeding, the num given a number, its successor is a result of adding one to it by its property. Property of one is, so what is he, what is he doing? He's using the property of the number one, which is now once again inherent. You cannot argue with it. You must know what one is. In terms of the property of one, he will describe the successor to the number n. Similarly for the predecessor. And that he needs, I mean, it's not like Bhaskaracharya, he actually needs it because there is this incredibly revolutionary thing that uh, Yuktivasha does, which probably Madhava uh, started, but uh, the only account we have is in Yuktivasha. This is the thing called the method of mathematical induction. There's another way of dealing with infinity in which you want to prove a property for an infinite set of objects. What you do is the following, you take two steps. One, you prove it for one member of the set. Then you say, logically, you prove that if it is true for this member of the set, it is true for the next member of the set. You prove that. 
So since this number is arbitrary, it is proof for everything. This is a very, very big logical leap. In fact, when Piano axiomatized uh, numbers in the, at the end of the 19th century, his first axiomatization lacked an axiom which will justify this step. So he supplied it later and it's called the induction axiom. Now, Yashtadeva has, you know, in the second chapter, there is this long discussion. I said, you know, why is he doing it? Everybody knows what addition is. Everybody knows what subtraction is. The reason is, in chapter 6, when he comes to the series for pi, he spends five pages describing the process of mathematical induction. It's very difficult, very abstract. So, uh, so there is really no answer. We'll struggle. As long as human beings exist, we will struggle with these notions. I think that's what makes it fascinating. Huh, but that is Bhaskaracharya's point of view. This thing that the, the, uh, the, the re relationship between succession and addition, uh, Shankaravadiyar will not, it does, does not have. Yeah. That's a very modern thing to do. Oh, yesterday was, you know, uh, I sometimes say uh, modernity is not an increasing function of time. You can be very modern in the past. I mean, Charaka is an example. I mean, some of the things you said today, you know, they're breathtaking, absolutely breathtaking. Never mind whether it's going to help you treat the 5% of the people or 10%. How many? What is the percent? 10% of the people who can be treated. Never mind. Many, many thanks to all of you. I have, you've, you've given me an absolutely wonderful two days here. This is for Sundar Eshwaran. Sertakala, <laughs> or at ten mission under Nani Varian Deskiana, Nani Varianical Anandamai Paranam, Uruba, all over Paranam, E. Chartasamela Tende, Alo, Jana Mudal, Nokumbo, Uruba, Bere, Yangal Dopan on the Tunda, Campus and Agatum Portum, Air Source Personality on the Tula, Divirens are Mudal, Tarek, Uruba, Bere, Campus Nagatua, Yangal E. Chartasamela Tula, Aubajari, the Turtum Uruka in the Parnata, Turtum or in the Valada Turtum, Ipoi, Idore, Objari, Tunum Parnaclo, Noniva, Karun Parantla, the Manasal Sushi, no, Urupa, Urupa, where Sahaj and the Yangal Kutigal and Yangal of Polorum, other Manasalaka Konda, Koreka, Dutial, Koreke, Nayada, Nolo, Orthogonda, Sahita Academy, Prategam, Paramasik and the Garnam Sahita Academy, the Hanasaha Logon to Matraman, Karim Trim, Pangi, Narnova, our Kerala Sahita Academy. Campus Lula, Matu Department Lula, Angana Paramatane, Anida, Kunduran, Angela, Angela Pula, Ela, Diava Rodum, Ela Gavesha Rodum, Gavesha with their Sodom, Ela Rodum, Pertechum, Divine Sarapalola, Etra, Vayada item, Pinim, Churzur Kodu or Tanpara and the Aritla, Apanya Nurtuno, Elavacam, Nani Namaskaram.